Good afternoon, folks. We are continuing our coverage here at IAC 2024, and I'm sure you've been able to tell from the title, we're going to be talking about Viper and how important that project was to our ambitions of establishing a permanent presence on the moon. That is before NASA canceled it, and uh, I'm joined here by Andrew. Andrew, would you be so kind as to introduce yourself to the viewers? Sure. So uh, I'm Andrew Hazelton, I'm the co-founder of uh, Interstellar Mapping and the CEO of Interstellar Innovation, which is our US organization. Uh, so we're, we're focused on uh, lunar resources and uh, building infrastructure to be able to extract water ice uh, out of lunar regolith uh, on the moon. Once again, uh, we got introduced as a result of the Aqualunar Challenge. So, uh, first of all, I mean, let's just give an overview of, most of the viewers are aware of Viper, but what sort of benefit was it bringing to folks like you? I mean, what sort of, uh, what advantages would Viper have brought to you if it were still going? Look, there's, there's just a lot of assumptions about uh, the contents of, of lunar regolith, um, you know, what, what minerals are actually in it, what actually, if there is actually water in it and what those percentages are. At the moment, it's kind of assumed that maybe there's 1% uh, water ice uh, in, in the lunar regolith, but it's also assumed that the uh, regolith is uniform or homogenous across the, f the whole lunar surface, which is you know, obviously not going to be the case. So we need more data points. At the moment, you know, the, the most... Uh, impactful data points are almost from 50 years ago with Luna 15 and 17 where there was actual um, you know digging down uh, to depth and um, you know Viper was going to provide you know in situ data that's going to be super valuable for companies like ours but you know all companies across the ecosystem anybody who's planning to do anything on the on the lunar surface. Thanks. So have you gotten an impression as to, uh, I mean, why did this happen? Have you heard it all as to why NASA made this decision? Certainly, it couldn't have been just the relatively pathetic amount of money that they're talking about when they explained it. Can you think of any other reasons why they made this move? I mean, officially, it seems like it is a budgetary decision. Um, you know, the, the, the project was, um, you know, in the $500 million range from what I understand, uh, or, or north of that, and that number had blown out a little bit. However, you know, budget cuts across NASA of, you know, a similar number just meant that programs needed to be cut. Um, I think what was disappointing uh, from our point of view was that, you know, this, uh, the Viper um, you know, rover was already completed and had finished testing. So now the amount of money required to keep the program running is you know, fairly small. From what I understand, it's around $6 million a month um, for probably six months to keep it at operation ready. So, you know, with the delay with uh, Astrobotics uh, launcher, um, you know, now that was just one of the key reasons for the the project to get, to get scrapped but you know if you've i understand sunk costs but you know if you've dropped five six hundred million dollars on on a on hardware that's you know actually ready to go and been fully tested then scrapping the whole program um you know for essentially you know maybe only 30 30 odd million dollars to to keep it going seems a little bit short-sighted and uh kind of questions NASA's priorities so you know from you know, supposedly you know the pillars of science national posture and inspiration are the foundation for NASA and you know cancelling a program like Viper probably in my opinion goes against uh, all three of those pillars so um, we hope that uh, you know I understand there's a you know, RFI out there for organizations or other companies to pick up pick up the project, but also that they have to give all data uh, from the, from the uh, program to 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 NASA. So essentially, they're asking companies to fly this uh, uh, device for free and then provide all the data. So. Um, Hopefully there's negotiations happening behind the scenes to, you know, find a more equitable uh, result and so Viper can fly. Now, I'm, uh, I'm well acquainted with the folks at Astrobotic. I've been uh, talking to them years before Peregrine even flew. And, of course, it was a devastating disappointment when that transpired. Do you feel that uh, the failure of Peregrine and therefore a lack of confidence in Griffin may also have been a big part of this? Um, I'm sure it played 
uh, you know, behind the scenes or in the minds of the people making those kind of decisions. But I must admit, I'm not uh, across that enough to really be able to provide a, a, a real uh, definitive answer. But I, I'm sure it did play a part of it. So in terms of, of where we're going on the moon, and I mean, we have... Artemis 3 ostensibly, you know, going at the end of 2026, which seems pretty unlikely as, you know, as I've mentioned a number of times on my channel. But once we do go, do you think we're really going to have the, the knowledge to make an educated decision as to where the best location to set down is? Or are we going to be kind of flying blind as, as we put two astronauts down on uh, the, the lunar south pole? Yeah, I mean, I think more data is, is required and Viper was definitely going to be a key element in, in helping make those decisions. You know, maybe there's going to be other programs from some of the other space agencies that's going to be able to help provide some of, the, some of that data. And, you know, there's 45 odd uh, countries that are part of the Artemis uh, Accord now. So uh, yeah, there's numerous other satellite programs going up that could potentially provide some of that, some of that information. But whether it's going to be available by 2026 uh, still remains to be seen. Uh, so yeah, 2026 does seem like an unlikely, unlikely date uh, for NASA to be putting humans back on the on the lunar surface. But yeah, always can be hopeful. So in terms of location, I mean, let's you know, let's uh, let's indulge uh, indulge you a bit and give you a lot of power here for a second. Let's say that you're in charge of the decision of where to establish our you know our permanent presence on the moon. Uh, where do you where do you want to put a base, and what sort of uh, qualifications would would that have, or and how might that differ? From, uh, from how NASA's handling it now. Where's the best place for us to get established and why? I mean, it, it certainly uh, seems across the industry that the South Pole has been identified as a, as, you know, a key, key spot because of the assumption of the water ice uh, potential content uh, in, in the regolith in those, in those areas. And that's you know, probably a, a pretty good, good assumption. But as for you know, where infrastructure needs to be, unfortunately, you know, where power is going to be able to be generated is not where humans are going to be able to be placed. Um, so you know, it, it's great that there's other companies out there working on either power transmission or other you know, uh, systems of, of power, whether that's going to be fusion. Um, but I think there needs to be a lot more analysis done and you know, internally our company has uh, performed a, a number of tests on on, uh, on 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 regolith and how it behaves when water is extracted out of it and there is uh, a lot more research that needs to be done even on compaction so um, you know if you take a sample of regolith with say 5% water uh, and you remove that water the compaction actually is almost 50% so that means that if you have a rover going over a, an area of regolith that compaction can be extremely high and also then if you're placing infrastructure in that same area you have uh, potential issues with stability of that infrastructure. What I learned the other day uh, which was um, fascinating was that you know, Apollo 14 was half a degree off uh, not being able to take off and you know, returning those uh, astronauts. So it was down to 11 and a half degrees uh, on a slant because of the compaction of the regolith where they landed. If it had gone to 12 degrees, then uh, you know, Apollo 15 to 17 wouldn't have happened either because that would have been the end of the Apollo program. So yeah, there needs to be a lot more research done uh, on, 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 this, on this area and you know, programs like Viper would have been able to help you know, fill in some of those gaps. Let me go ahead and ask one last question here then, kind of uh, based on what you've just said. Given the fact that we have 100 metric tons worth of stainless steel, plus payload, plus fuel, that sort of thing, setting down on the lunar regolith with lunar starship and all that, um, and then, uh, you know, assuming that it'll, we'll, it'll be returning as well, I mean, what do you think the biggest challenges are going to be based on what you just said about Apollo 14 um, versus the Apollo missions? Much bigger ship? Do we know enough about the regular to be sure that, that something that huge is going to work on something that doesn't have a landing pad? 
Yeah, well, I mean, landing pad is the key there. So there's a lot of companies working in the space for you know 3D printing technology to you know create these you know landing pads. Um, once again, there's a huge number of assumptions of what the contents of the regolith is to be able to help build those build those kind of landing pads, and that's that's being worked on. But then you also have regolith uh, essentially debris or you know spray essentially from uh, even coming off a, a landing pad. <coughs> yeah. A, um, a ship the size of you know, Starship taking off uh, off the lunar surface is going to have a huge amount of um, you know, debris spread. So you have to factor that in with you know, where you're placing infrastructure and other you know, important machines. And obviously, all of the machines that are going landing on the lunar surface are extremely um, uh, need to be extremely robust anyway. But you know, adding in uh, you know, airborne uh, debris from from regolith which is you know extremely damaging um you know and it's the the regolith itself is you know extremely you know sharp in essence and you know getting that into uh, some of these really refined machines would would be catastrophic so once again there needs to be a lot more research done uh, on on how that regolith is going to behave in 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 these new kind of uh, scenarios Really appreciate your time. Thanks so much for your uh, for coming by, Andrew. This has been a very interesting conversation. I look forward to talking to you again. All right, thanks, Jordan.